continuing in our spectator series, and today um, is called Reckless Abandon. And I want you to think about that terminology because a lot of times it comes with negative connotation, but that's not how we mean it. What we want you to start to think about is something that you've given all of yourself to. Now, for some of you, um, you like to just kind of stay in the middle of things. You don't necessarily give yourself all the way to anything. So I'm going to call you up to something different today because I would actually argue that you do. It just doesn't seem like you do or you probably don't think you do. For some of you, reckless abandon is the way you live your life. We want to talk to you too, okay? Because that can be super unhealthy also because I'm talking to myself with this. I'm a very all-in person, especially when I am about something that I believe in. I cannot sell something I believe in, don't believe in, and I can't live for something that I don't believe in. And so I'm going to give you this definition of reckless abandon. It combines the sense of carelessness, so that's the side where people would observe carelessness, not necessarily that you are, with the idea of yielding oneself to an action of impulse without restraint. So I want you to imagine the last time that you had an impulse without restraint. A lot of times that is something that we go after that is not good for us, right? But sometimes it is. So a person jumping into something with reckless abandon is going into it wholeheartedly, perhaps impulsively, and with no concern for consequences or danger. When was the last time you did anything like that? Have you ever done anything like that? It's going into it wholeheartedly, perhaps impulsively, with no concern for consequences or danger. My family went recklessly abandoned for Jesus when he called us to ministry. Let me tell you the story. Some of you already know this, but my wife and I both grew up in Greenwood right here. We both went to Greenwood High School. Um, it's weird to have a church in your hometown that's not very normal, by the way, because you see all the people you did all the bad stuff with back in the day, and then when you tell them that you're a pastor, they laugh. <laughs> and I say, I promise, just come and see. <laughs> so we um, felt like God was calling us to Florida. We worked with a uh, man and woman in one of the churches here in Greenwood that we participated with. We helped them with the student ministry. They moved to Florida back home for them and took over a church. Well, they asked a man and I to come down and help them run the church and get things going with it. And so I was in the middle of Bible college. This is 2001. And we felt like God called us to go. But let me tell you the scenario. We had a one-year-old and a two-year-old, grandparents that didn't want us to leave, um, and we honestly didn't want to leave. We were very happy with our life. And so God, uh, this guy flew me down there. I said, honey, you stay here. I'm going to go there. I'm going to spend a week with him. I'll preach in the church. We have to come back with the same answer. So I came back. My wife was at home with our two little ones, bless her heart. And she agreed we should move our family a thousand miles away to a place where we knew no one except those two people. Well, the kicker of all of it is we didn't have a place to live and we had $400 in our pocket. On paper, that was a really unwise move. But God said, no, I want you to go, and I want you to trust me, I've got you. What happened with that reckless abandon of us going all the way in is the reason why I'm standing here today. I thought I was going to Florida to be put on staff at a church, and God said, now that I've got you out of Indiana, I can do what I want with you to shape you and mold you for ultimately what I want to do with your life. I'd never heard the term church planting before. I thought as a pastor I would go in and take a church over because that's what I knew of pastoring. And as we are nearing, we're about year three of living there, I was very frustrated with God because I had sent out over 100 resumes to churches and never even got a response. Super frustrated. As I sit down with this older, wiser man who is a church planter, and I don't realize this at the time, I'm ranting and raving about my frustration with God. I'm giving up on ministry. I had a really good job making more money than I'd ever made. I'm going full into my career. Forget about ministry is what I told him. He just sits there and he smiles and he nods his head. And he goes, Mike, I feel like God is telling me right now in my spirit, don't give up on ministry. You're on the right road. You're in the wrong lane. Have you ever thought about planting a church? I had no idea what that meant. But as soon as he said it, everything became very clear to me. Now, if my family would not have went recklessly abandoned in towards what we felt like God called us to, I would not have been sitting in that seat with that guy, and I would not be standing here in front of you. I'm confident of it. 
And so what I'm asking you today is, have you ever done this? Have you ever like listened to the Lord so deeply and intentionally that it would recklessly abandon you into something that you're not doing now? Now, I know that word reckless has a negative connotation, but I want to put this in the light of what I think God is calling us to even today, because it will seem reckless if you go all in for Jesus today. So I've been thinking about and praying about our, our lack of spiritual formation in the church today, and God revealed some pretty interesting things to me, I think. 2020 has changed the world forever. It will never go back to what it used to be. The sooner we can come to grips to that, with that, the better we are going to be. If you have hear, heard this for the first time, church, I apologize. <laughs> it's never, ever going to be the same. I think we're starting to realize that two years into this. But I just want to make you sure you hear me say it's never going to be the way that it was. But what it has done, it's sparked a nostalgia revolution for people who are trying to readjust things to the way they used to be. People are doing this in churches, relationships, social status, and things that have been threatened to go away from their lives. But what I've watched emerge on this side of 2020 is a much bolder group of people. A very opinionated people who form groups and fight for what they believe in. People who are organizing protests, rallies, and Facebook groups to support their convictions and ideas. Now, I want you to think about this in light of people not ever wanting to stand out before. One of the communities that we've seen grow immensely through this process is the LGBTQ community. We've watched people step into the light unafraid of the feelings they have that were once shunned by society. For an example, the most overall shunned group of people by our society has been the LGBT plus community, LGBTQ plus community. Statistically, the ones who were willing to publicly identify with this community were under 3% of our population, or about 8.4 million people. Since 2020, it has increased to 5.5% or 16.8% million people. It's doubled. Before 2020, it was only the boldest who would step into the light and say, this is who I am. But everything has changed in 2020. People are stepping into what they want to be at a rate much higher than we've ever seen before, and they're being bold at the same time. But statistically, this doesn't make any sense. A recent survey just released said that 94% of people don't want to be noticed by anybody. They want to blend into the fabric of everything, yet we have all been emboldened by what we've gone through, it seems like. Many people have given into reckless abandon, so what does this mean for us as followers of Jesus? See, one of the things that I have noticed, church, is that people who I saw never even say a word in a group of people are now some of the boldest people that I know. People who just kind of kept to themselves in society are now some of the ones that are leading things in our society. See, it's fundamentally changed everything. And the reason why I tell you this is because we have an opportunity as followers of Jesus to step into that same thing with the love of Christ. So we're going to go to Matthew 15, and I want to, we're going to start here, and then we're going to actually go back to the story we talked about last week. But I want to show you something here. This is Jesus, and we're going to start in verse 1. And I want to show you what one of the things he says I think is the problem with us today. So Matthew 15, starting in verse 1. He says, Then Jesus was approached by the Pharisees and the scribes from Jerusalem who asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. Now, let me set this up for you. I want you to think about the traditions of yours that were broken in 2020, okay? You're trying to revive them, renew them. The things that were the way that they were, they've been broken. They're not that way anymore. And I want you to think about this is the context of the Pharisees coming to Jesus, trying to catch him off guard and say, why are your disciples, these people who follow you, breaking all the traditions of our elders? Which, by the way, by law, was punishable all the way to death in some regards. So Jesus, being the cool, calm, collected guy that he was, answers them like this. Why do you break God's commandment because of your traditions? Ooh. The Pharisees are the ones who held up every single point of the law. They held all the traditions. 
But they also had a problem of adding their own. So God says this. For God said, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. How many of you of children would have died? Let's go ahead and raise it up. I would not be here, I promise. <laughs> this is not a joke, though. In Deuteronomy, when they passed down the laws in the children of Israel, it was punishable all the way up to death. Now, if I just said something negative about my parents, I could have been actually publicly beaten for that. I would have never made it past five, probably. <laughs> I was a punk, I guess. I don't know. So here's what he goes on to say, now that you understand the context of that. But you say, whoever tells his father or mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple. He does not have to honor his father in this way. You have nullified the word of God because of your tradition. Hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their, hearts, their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrine, human commands. Now, I want you to see what Jesus did. He took their question to him. He flipped it around on them and said, why are you questioning me? You actually do this too. In fact, it's worse because you are actually making doctrine, human commands. Now, I want you to think about this. How many of you are wholeheartedly convinced what you know about Jesus and how you live for Jesus is biblical? It's not what somebody told you you should believe or how you should live. Like what's biblical in your life and what is human tradition in your life? Because these things get confused a lot. And we will hold on to human tradition like no other and defend it like crazy. These Pharisees did that so much to the point that they called Jesus out on it. And he was, in fact, not even breaking any commands. He was shifting something different to uphold all the points of the law. And then he put their sin in front of them and they didn't even see it. So for us, my question is, where are the Christians in all of this stepping out of the shadows, in all of this boldness, where are the Christians? Why have we not stepped up and put the love of Jesus to the front of everything? I'm glad you asked, by the way. I have an idea for you. You ready? Verse 9 says, they worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines human commands. I'm going to ask one more time. How many human doctrines do you think you believe as the truth of Jesus, when in reality, they are just that, human commands? doctrines. Let me give you an example of how you might be believing them. When you go to scripture, you see what it says clearly in black and white. If you know anything about biblical language, there's some that's hyperbolic. There's some that is literal. There's some that's figurative. And when you go and you read a command from Jesus that's literal and you do something different, you have believed a human command is more important than the doctrine of Jesus. And a lot of times we'll live our lives that way. Even when we're called out, we'll have a response to tell why we do what we do. So what I think Jesus is calling us to is something completely different, church. Think about the stage that's been set, though. How many groups of people do you know that are no longer accepted by society? I don't really know any. There is one group, I, I should say. It's the angry Christians. They are not accepted by society, nor should they be. I want you to think about the difference in what it would be like to lead with the love of Jesus rather than the way that we have seen. For an example, the way I've unfortunately watched Christians step up is in major attack and major defense attacking anyone or anything that comes against what they think is right. The major defense comes in when we're, they are questioned or Jesus is questioned. But unfortunately, Christians have, haven't been exempt to the feeling of nostalgia. It almost seems like we want a 1950s and 60s version of the world when Andy Griffith was on everybody's TVs and everybody went to church on Sunday. You might say, yeah, but people were nicer, times were simpler, and it would have been so much easier to live for Jesus back then. Those may or may not be true, but nonetheless, it doesn't change the commands 
of Jesus. Let me help you out with something. The Bible is very clear that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Amen? Good. So it isn't going anywhere, and we do not need to be its lawyers to defend it. Also, amen? A lot fewer amens. Also, don't you think the enemy might have a strategy of distraction towards things that don't matter in light of eternity to keep you away from sharing the love of Jesus because we're too busy defending him? I think he does. And I think if he can keep us distracted with things that don't matter, he's winning all day long. I would have been an excellent lawyer. In fact, every personality test that I do says that that should have been one of my top career choices. Ask my wife. I'm very good. Not to my benefit, by the way. (laughs) But I have never won anyone to Jesus by arguing with them. So here is what I want to ask you. Don't answer me, but just I want you to answer this question in your heart. Are you willing to become a fully matured, spiritually formed follower of Jesus, willing to stand out in the crowd and win people to Jesus by the love you show them because of him? This is what I think Jesus is asking us. For too long, church, that same percentage that I gave you about a community that was very ostracized by our country, unfortunately, has been about the same percentage of followers of Jesus truly living for him, driving the mission of Jesus forward. What I want to call us to something different, and I just want to ask you, what does it matter if somebody doesn't accept you here on this earth, honestly? Why have we given so much power to people that we care so much about what they think about us that it literally determines the way we live our life? What will they ever do for me? And then let's go the other way. What if they do accept you? What is that going to benefit you? What is that going to get me if the most popular person where I go often accepts me? What is that ever going to get me? Literally nothing. Nothing. Yet we live in this society that lives and dies by likes and dislikes, and I just want to be a part of this thing, and it never gets us anything, does it? My question is, why do we live so much for this when we have a Savior who said, I know everything about you and I accept you. You don't even have to try for likes with me. I like you. (laughs) In fact, I love you. I died to make your salvation possible. You don't even have to earn my approval over and over. You have it in your salvation. See, when you, when you are understanding of the way that Jesus accepts you, it will make you stop living for everybody else's acceptance. And I think the biggest problem with us today, church, is we forget the gospel and we forget the day of our salvation. And we are desperately living for others' approval. Let's go back. Actually, I want to show you a slide because you hear us talking about spiritual formation, and I want to give you a definition from Dallas Willard that we're going to keep up pretty frequently. When we talk about spiritual formation, we are talking about framing a progression of life in which people come to actually do all the things Jesus taught. So we are obviously going for the heart. We are aiming for change of the inner person where what we do originates. So I want you to think about what you do, okay? How you spend your time, how you spend your money, how you act towards people, how you react towards people. I want you to realize this is coming from you internally, okay? We can say, well, I had a bad day and you don't understand what I'm going through. Okay, those things all may be true, but they're coming from inside of you, okay? Spiritual formation frames something different to where your entire life is framed around the commands of Jesus. You're actually living them. It's getting at the heart, and what is being produced out of you are the things that Jesus did. And so this is what we mean when we talk about spiritual formation. So we're going to go back to the story we were in last week, but we're going to go a little bit deeper. Let's go back to Luke chapter 7. We're going to look at verse 36 and 39. I want to ask you a question, though. What was at risk of this lady acting the way she did because of reckless abandon? She moved from spectator to follower, and I want you to see what it might have cost her. 
in 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house, and this is Jesus, and reclined at the table. And a woman at the town, in the town who was a sinner, that was, means she was a prostitute, found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with her perfume. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Now, Kyle Eidelman wrote a book not a, called Not a Fan, and he gives, a, I think, a pretty brilliant description of this interchange. And I want to read it to you, okay? Just follow along and listen, all right? <clears throat> We're picking up kind of mid-thought of why this woman would have even went to this dinner. His eyes communicated her value and worth. She wasn't just a sinner to him. She was a beloved daughter. And perhaps when Jesus finished teaching, she knew God loved her and he hadn't given up on her, even if everybody else had. She must, not, she must have whispered something like this to herself. Maybe it's not too late for me. Maybe even someone like me can follow him. She was desperate to see Jesus again. And she overheard someone saying that he was having dinner at the home of Simon the Pharisee a dinner she would have never been invited to attend, not in a thousand years. Of course, normally, she would have no interest in attending. She had felt the condemning glares of the Pharisees enough to stay as far away as possible from places like Simon's house. But she had to see Jesus. It's hard to imagine what it would have taken her to just walk into that courtyard, but she is so focused on Jesus that she forgets about herself. She's desperate to express the love and affection she feels for him. What she does next is reckless, it's impulsive, it's inappropriate, and it's exactly the kind of follower Jesus wants. Picture this scene. Jesus is reclining at the table. Instead of using chairs, they would lean on an elbow that was propped up by a cushion. Their feet would be away from the table. This woman approaches and stands at the filthy feet of Jesus. The table grows silent. Everybody is watching. Everybody knows who she is. What is she doing? She looks around at the guests. She feels from some that familiar glare of condemnation. Others keep their eyes down, embarrassed by her presence and the awkwardness of the moment. But when she looks at Jesus, he seems to know what has happened in her heart. He gives her a warm smile. He seems delighted that she has come, and he looks at her with the eyes of a loving father watching his beautiful daughter into the room. She's never had a man look at her that way before. She's so undone by this that tears come. Just a few at first and then a few more. She falls to the ground and begins to kiss his feet. The tears are coming, pouring out of her face. They begin to drip onto the dirty feet of Jesus. As she looks at the muddy streaks, she suddenly realizes that his feet haven't been washed. She can't ask for a towel, so she lets her hair down. In those days, women always wore their hair up in public. For a woman to wear her hair down was an intimate expression that it was so intimate that it was literally grounds for divorce if she let it down in the presence of another man. She lets her hair down in front of Jesus, and there was likely an audible gasp. She begins washing the feet of Jesus with her tears and drying them with her hair. Luke says she has this alabaster jar of ointment. Most likely, this refers to a flask that was often worn around the neck as a kind of perfume for women. As you might guess, because of her profession, this flask was quite important. She'd used it a drop at a time, many, many times, for many men. But now she empties it. She just empties the whole thing out. She won't need it anymore. She pours this flask, her entire life, on his feet, and then she kisses them over and over. In the end... The religious leader with all the knowledge is the fan or the spectator. And the prostitute who intimately expressed her love for Jesus is shown to be the follower. Here then is the question you and I have to ask. Who are you most like in the story? It's easy to say I would be like the prostitute who recklessly abandoned everything, my social status, which was already low, but 
People knew who I was, and they accepted me for who I was, and probably a lot of the men in that courtyard might have even visited her. But the embarrassment that she would have had to deal with to even walk into that courtyard all went away because she just had to see Jesus. The Pharisees, however, who were on the side looking in, disgusted by this woman, unfortunately, a lot of times is what our reactions are to people. See, church, for some reason, we seem to forget our own sin when we look at other people's sin. We seem to forget what we were rescued from and what Jesus set us free from. And so it's really easy to be a Pharisee and to look at other people and and be so angry and so mad and so defensive, so offensive where we go towards them because we are seething mad. We think, how could you do something like that? I can't believe you would live your lifestyle like that. And so as we rise to the top of this spectatorship, There's unfortunately a group of followers of Jesus who are rising in his defense and he doesn't need it. What I'm asking us to do is to rise with the love of Jesus that compelled you to him in the first place and set you free from all those awful sins that if anyone in this room knew, they would never talk to you again. The ones that Jesus only knows. The one that Jesus hides and keeps and says, I've forgiven you for all of those. Something different needs to arise today, church. Reckless abandon needs to happen in all of us. I'm going to close with this slide. And I want you to contemplate these words. This quote's been around for a long time. It's by Brennan Manning. It's incredibly, <laughs> incredible quote. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And we're going to leave this up because I want you to contemplate what this says, what Brennan Manning is saying here. People who believe in Jesus, it's good. Uh, It's where this starts. But people who are pretty intentional on calling themselves followers of Jesus, and they just live a different life that is in contrast to what Jesus says we should be living like. I just want you to hear that that is the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today, are followers of Jesus who acknowledge him with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. I can't sell something I don't believe. I believe wholeheartedly in Jesus that I have recklessly abandoned my entire life to him. I don't care what he calls me to do. I don't care where he calls me to go. I don't care who he tells me to talk to. I don't care what that other person says to me. And I don't do this in an arrogant, flippant way. It's because I know what he saved me from. I know the sin that if you knew, you would never come back to this church that he set me free for. I know that the day of my salvation was not owed to me, that as he set me free, he said, now go all in for me. And I said, I'm in. I don't ever want to be the reason why somebody looks at my life and says, that is why I'm not a Christian. And I know you don't either, church. But there has to be a point when we move from believing to following, from spectator to follower, we have to go all in. If you are going to claim the name of Jesus, you have to go all in. And here's what I would say. Would you rather be shunned, be ostracized a little bit at work, be not in the popular crowd here on earth or stand in front of Jesus one day and wish you could come back and do it all over again. Because I assure you, whatever you're going to get down here on earth, I'd take that all day, every day, than looking Jesus in the face and going, 
weeping and weeping and weeping. The question is, if you're a spectator, are you ready to move into being a fully devoted follower of Jesus? Now, for those of you that are not followers of Jesus in this room, you've heard a pretty heavy sermon today about what it means to truly follow Jesus. And I'm glad you heard it. Because I'm not even trying to talk you into following Jesus. I'm really not. I want you to. I want you to surrender your life to him, but I I don't want you to do it because I told you you need to. You have to come to the realization in your life that you can no longer run your life, that what you've tried and what you've tried to accomplish has left you short every time. You have to come to the realization that this Jesus is offering you something you can never, ever achieve on your own. And you have to come to the realization that in order to receive all of that, that is hands over, full surrender, reckless abandon, the rest of my life is yours, Jesus. I'm not trying to talk you into that because if I can convince you to do it right now, you're not going to live for him for the rest of your life. This is you in him. So the question is, if you're sitting here, you're watching online, are you willing to say, man, what I've done is not getting me anywhere. This is the best it's going to get for me. I recognize you as the Savior, Jesus. So this is the place I came when I literally dropped to my knees in my apartment and said, I cannot do this anymore. Jesus, I surrender everything to you. It says that my heart of stone was replaced with the heart of flesh. The Holy Spirit came and he lived inside of me and my life has never been the same since, church. I don't regret anything about following Jesus. I pray that your heart has been stirred and moved if you're a follower of Jesus. To know that he calls you to reckless abandon. To know that living any other way for any other thing is so futile. It offers you nothing except heartache and regret. Spiritual formation, as we walk through this, will teach you these practices and how to live like this. Stick with us this year. Learn what these mean. But give reckless abandon to Jesus right now. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Jesus, I know that it's hard to live for you today. I know that. But if we understand what we were saved and rescued and set free from, God, we would be able to see this truly for what it is. The enemy is so good at distracting us with things that just really don't matter. So good at convincing us that What the world says is right. So good at shifting our eyes away from the beauty of you, Jesus, to the short-lived futility of the world that makes it so appealing. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would burden our hearts so deeply for us to have this reckless abandoned mentality. To be so all in for you, Jesus, that you're the the thing that consumes our thoughts, our lifestyles, our schedules, everything that we do. That people would notice the way that we live our lives. They listen to the way that we talk. They watch us as we react to things that happen to us and they go, okay, okay. I've been watching you for a while. What in the world is different about you? And then we would be so bold to share the gospel. Let us live differently, Jesus. Let us rise to the group who is the loudest leading with love, the love of you. Father, we just pray that you would be with our people here today. 
the ones who are followers, the ones who are not yet following. Those who are not yet following, God, would you give them the boldness just to come back and talk to us? Start typing in the chat box right now to start talking to us and asking questions. Would you give our people the boldness to come back and say, hey, I'm all in. What do I do? Help me. So I pray that as we wrap up with one last song, that we would do business with you right now, Jesus. We love you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. If you need prayer, you need to talk.